Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for the awesome privilege of being here again to study your holy word. And as we study about the cult of the Virgin Mother, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide our minds and our hearts into all truth. I not only ask for those who are gathered here, but I also ask for those who are viewing on the many television sets across the world. I ask that you will open minds and hearts, and I thank you for hearing my prayer, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin our study today by turning to a verse which is very close to my heart. I'm referring to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. So please turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. This is actually the Bible in miniature form. And uh, we've studied this verse many times before, but now we want to look at it from a new perspective. That verse says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, that is between the serpent and the woman, and between your seed, that is the serpent's seed, and her seed. He, the seed of the woman, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now you notice here that the enmity runs three ways. Between the serpent and the woman, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, and between the seed of the woman and the serpent. The primary enmity, however, is between the seed of the woman and the serpent. Because the last part of the verse says, He, the seed of the woman, shall bruise your head, the serpent's head, and you shall bruise his heel. So the primary enmity is between the serpent and the seed of the woman. Now, there's a Greek translation of the Old Testament which is known as the Septuagint, or the version of the 70. It's uh, abbreviated, in fact, LXX, which is the number 70. And in this translation, something very peculiar happens. Even though the word seed in this verse in Greek is sperma, which is neuter, it's interesting that the pronoun that goes with the word seed in the Septuagint is masculine. That's very unusual because usually the pronoun and the noun must agree. Now in Hebrew it says, it shall bruise your head. In other words, because it's a seed, it is an it. It's not a he or a she. But the Septuagint changes it to, from it to he, even though the noun is neuter. And this is the only time in the Greek Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, where you find this phenomenon in the Septuagint. Interestingly enough, the Latin Vulgate, which was translated by Jerome in the early 300s, uh, was a Latin translation from the Greek Septuagint. And Jerome, instead of translating as the Septuagint had it, he shall bruise your head, he actually changed the pronoun to she shall bruise your head. In spite of the fact that he was translating the Old Testament from the Septuagint virgin version of the Old Testament. In other words, in the Vulgate we find that it is a she, the woman who is going to crush the head of the serpent, instead of the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent. Now it's very interesting to notice that in all of the genealogies of Scripture, the job of procreation is attributed to men. You look for example at the genealogy of Genesis chapter 5, and you'll notice a list of ten men there in that genealogy, and it said there that they begot the person that came after them. In Genesis 11 we have another genealogy or list of descendants. Once again, it is the men who are doing the procreating. 
You look at the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Jesus. Once again, it is men who are doing the beginning, even though four women are mentioned. The men who are connected with those women are also mentioned in the genealogy. In other words, the work of procreation in Scripture, the work of begetting is attributed to men. But interestingly enough, in Genesis 3 and verse 15, we find an exception to the rule. Because we're told in this verse, not that this seed would be begotten by a man, but that this seed would be born from a woman. The seed of the woman. We seem to get the impression that this particular seed is going to come into the world born of a woman without the intervention of a man. That's why we're told that the seed is born of the woman. Now these words were pronounced by God to Satan. And when Satan heard these words he said, so God is going to send a seed born of the woman to the world that is going to do battle with me. God is saying that he's going to crush my head and I am going to bruise his heel. I wonder how that's going to happen. We need to go to Genesis 3 and verse 21 to understand how this was going to happen. You remember that when Adam and Eve sinned, the first result of their sin is that they discovered that they were naked. I don't have time to go into it, but really before this they were covered with the glorious robe of light, such as that which clothes God. In fact Psalm 104 verses 1 and 2 says that God clothes himself with light as with a garment. The woman which represents the true church in Revelation 12, we're told that she's clothed with the sun. When Jesus was transfigured, his robes shone like the light. In other words, Adam and Eve were covered with light. But when they sinned, the first result was that the robe of light left them and they noticed that they were naked. And so we're told in Genesis 3 and verse 7 that they tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves. But even after covering their nakedness with fig leaves, they still felt naked. Because God came to the garden and He said, Adam and Eve, where are you? And Adam says, well we hid in the garden because we were naked. The fact is that they weren't naked anymore because they had covered themselves with fig leaves. This shows that their nakedness was not primarily a nakedness of body, it was a nakedness of soul. And the devil is observing what is happening. He's saying, when they're innocent, when they're holy in the sight of God, when they're loyal to God, they have a robe of light. They sin, suddenly they're naked. The robe of light is gone. And then the devil sees how they cover themselves with fig leaves and they're still naked. And the devil is saying, I wonder how they're going to be restored to their original condition. Notice Genesis 3 and verse 21. We find here, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So the devil is watching and he's saying, look at what a peculiar way that God clothes Adam and Eve and covers their nakedness. Animals die. He takes the skins of the animals and he clothes their nakedness so that they're no longer naked in his sight. And the devil is thinking, hmm, the seed is going to be born of a woman without the intervention of a man. Is it perhaps the case that he is also going to suffer death and in this way he's going to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve and they're going to be restored to their original condition. Now scripture makes it very clear that Jesus was born into this world through the work of a woman without the intervention of a man. Just like Genesis 3 and verse 15 says. Notice for example Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16. It says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus Christ, who is called, Jesus who is called the Christ. Now, do you notice in this verse that Joseph is excluded as the father of Jesus? Notice once again, reading carefully, it says that Joseph was the husband of Mary and that of Mary was born whom? Jesus, who is called the Christ. 
Notice also Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. Very explicitly the Apostle Paul explains that this seed was going to be born of a woman without the intervention of a man. And of course we've studied that he was going to die, he was going to suffer death, and in this way the nakedness, the spiritual nakedness of man was going to be covered. Galatians 4 and verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now let me ask you this question. Against whom is the wrath of Satan particularly guided? Is it against the woman or is it against the seed of the woman? Well, if you read the Vulgate, it would seem to indicate that the enmity is between the serpent and the woman because supposedly the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. But Scripture makes it very clear that the target of the devil's attacks was going to be not the woman but the seed. The center, in other words, is the seed. You say, how do we know that? Well, you remember the story of Cain and Abel. They were born, Cain first, Abel afterwards. And the Bible tells us, to make a long story short, that Cain killed his brother Abel. You see the devil saw something special in Abel. He said perhaps this is the seed, or perhaps from, perhaps from him is going to come the seed. And so he feels the necessity to cut the life of Abel short. Notice that his attack is not against Eve. His attack is against whom? His attack is against Abel, the seed. Also, we notice, very interesting, that when Abel died, we're told in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 25, that God gave Eve another seed in place of Abel, whom Cain had killed. Once again, the emphasis does not fall upon the woman, the enmity between the devil and the woman, the enmity is between the devil and the seed. The center of focus is the seed. Notice also Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. This is speaking about the birth of Jesus. And notice that the woman is not the primary target of the devil's wrath. It is the seed of the woman. Notice Revelation 12 and verse 4. Speaking about this seven-headed dragon, we're told his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Notice that the enmity isn't between the serpent and the woman primarily. The serpent is not interested at least uh, in the first instance of destroying the woman. The serpent is interested in destroying the seed because the seed is going to give him a death blow on his head. Now notice this very interesting comment in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 66. You know the devil is a quick learner. The devil knew very well what was going to happen when he saw uh, that first sacrifice and when he heard God say that he was going to send a seed born of the woman. We find this very interesting statement. When Satan heard that enmity should exist between himself and the woman and between his seed and her seed, he knew that his work of depraving human nature would be interrupted. That by some means man would be enabled to resist his power. Yet as the plan of salvation was more fully unfolded, Satan, now notice this, Satan rejoiced with his angels that having caused man's fall, he could bring down the Son of God from his exalted position. Did the devil already know in the Old Testament that he was going to bring Jesus down to this earth to save man? According to this statement, absolutely. And we're going to notice as we study history that this is the case. She continues saying, he declared that his plans had thus far been successful upon the earth and that when Christ should take upon himself human nature he also might be overcome and thus the redemption of the fallen race might be prevented. And so the devil had this clear picture in his mind as the plan of salvation developed. He says, the seed is going to be born of a woman without the intervention of a man because 
this is not speaking about a man begetting this seed. It is a woman who is bringing the seed into the world. This seed obviously is going to live a perfect life. And he is going to suffer death in place of his creatures. Obviously he's going to be born of a virgin as I've mentioned. And his father is going to be God. It's not going to be any human man. And so the devil formed this clear picture in his mind about what God was planning to do to redeem the human race. And so the devil made up his mind that he was going to plant a counterfeit in every nation of planted planet earth of this plan that God had revealed that he was going to implement. Go with me to Genesis chapter 10 and verses 8 through 10. Genesis chapter 10 and verses 8 through 10. This is describing uh, the story of the establishment of the nation of Babylon, ancient Babylon. And it says there, Cush begot Nimrod. Nimrod means rebellion incidentally. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was what? The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. In other words, the builder of the tower of Babel was a man called Nimrod. Rebellion. Now I want you to notice what happened at Babel. You know that the languages were confused there. But something interesting happened at this tower of Babel whose builder was this rebellious man Nimrod. Notice Genesis 11 and verses 8 and 9. Genesis 11 verses 8 and 9. It says here, So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. And they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. Did you notice here that every nation on planet earth had its origin at Babel? This is extremely significant. Because we're going to find that what the devil did at Babel, he established this counterfeit religion, and through this counterfeit religion, because uh, this, this, these nations went all over the earth from Babel, they took this counterfeit or apostate religion to every nation on planet earth. Now you're saying which counterfeit religion? The ancient records show that Nimrod became a legendary figure. In fact, it was believed back then that when Nimrod died he went to heaven and he became the sun god. Now he had a wife whose name was Semiramis and Semiramis was still alive on planet earth after Nimrod had gone to heaven and become the sun god. And it just so happens that by a supernatural miracle Semiramis became pregnant not by the work of any man but she was actually inseminated according to their ideas by the sun god Nimrod. Does this begin to sound a little bit familiar? You know you have a god in heaven and he inseminates a, a virgin on earth and of course she had a son and the name of her son was Tamus. Interestingly enough Tamus was born on December 25th according to the ancient records. Now when Semiramis died, interestingly enough, she also ascended to the heavens and she became the moon goddess. In other words, after her death she also had an assumption to heaven. Now you say, where in the world did the devil get this phenomenal idea about a god in heaven inseminating a woman on earth and a child, a supernatural child being born from this woman on planet earth and that the woman eventually was assumed to heaven and became the moon god. Where would the devil create such a scenario? The fact is that the devil knew very well the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 
where it spoke about a woman, obviously a virgin, that was going to bring a child into the world, not through the beginning of a man, but by a supernatural work of God. And interestingly enough, later on we find in the Christian church the idea that uh, Jesus went to heaven and then His mother later was assumed to heaven as well. Do you know that many nations in antiquity had this idea of a mother God and her child? Let me just mention some examples of this. The Sumerians had a mother God called Nana. The, in Egypt the goddess was Isis and her son was Horus. In Canaan you have Baal and Ashtaroth. The Greeks had a woman called Aphrodite. The Etruscans had a goddess called Nutria, a mother god. In Asia the mother was called Cybele and her son was Deus or her child was Deus. In Rome you had Venus or Fortuna who was the mother and you had Jupiter who was the child. Even in China the mother's na mother god's name is Xingmu which means holy mother and she's depicted as having a child in her arms and there are rays coming forth from her head. In other words she has a halo around her head. In India you have the goddess Indrani and she's also portrayed in ancient art as having a child in her arms. The Germans had the virgin Hertha that they worshiped and her child also in her arms. The Scandinavians had uh, Dysa and she also in the artwork has a child in her hands. The Druids had Virgo Patitura and worshiped her as the mother of God officially. And of course Ephesus had Diana. By the way Paul had no love for this goddess Diana. He told exactly what should be done in the case of a goddess like this. He had no idea of Christianity blending or mixing with this apostate religion. Notice Acts chapter 19 and verses 24 to 27. Acts 19 verses 24 to 27. Here we find the following description of the religion of Diana. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. Notice uh, he made statues, statues of this uh, goddess Diana. It became a real good business. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So, not only is this trait of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. Interesting that the Apostle Paul would have nothing to do with this idea of an apostate pagan goddess. And those who worshiped Diana knew very well the perspective that the Apostle Paul had. Now I'd like to go for a moment back to the Old Testament to God's people, Israel. Because this has something very important to tell us about uh, the, uh, how would I say, the almost veneration of Mary in the Christian world today, particularly in the Roman Catholic Church. I want you to notice what God told Israel before they entered the land of Canaan. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verses 1 through 6. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess, and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations, greater and mightier than thou, and when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give them your daughter nor to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. 
so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for Himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Notice that God told Israel, don't you have any contact with pagan nations and with their pagan practices. Don't have anything to do with their altars, with their icons, with their ceremonies. Remain totally separated from them. And yet Israel did not listen to the counsel of the Lord. Notice Judges chapter 10 and verse 6. Judges chapter 10 and verse 6. It says, Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and they forsook the Lord and did not serve Him. So notice that instead of remaining separate from these pagan nations and from their practices and from their images and from their altars they mixed and they blended with these nations. Now we might ask the question at this point before we continue looking at the story of Israel, would God give the same counsel to his Christian church today? Would he allow the Christian church to adopt practices from pagan nations and altars from pagan nations and icons from pagan nations and ceremonies and rites from pagan nations? Absolutely not. If God said to Israel, remain separate, do not adopt anything that has to do with them, God would give the same counsel to the Christian church. He would not give the Christian church the opportunity of baptizing pagan practices and adopting them into the Christian church. Things became really terrible in Israel. Notice Ezekiel chapter 8 and verses 6 and 14. Ezekiel chapter 8 and I want to read verse 6 and also verse 14. It says here, Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Now turn again, you will see greater abominations. And now notice verse 16. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tamas. Do you remember we spoke about Tamas? Tamas was the son, the supernatural son of Nimrod. Israel at this point is actually lamenting Tamas. And by the way, what's happening here is that it was believed that and, and this is, uh, by the way, astronomically true. In December, the days get shorter and shorter and shorter. They believed that that meant that Tamus was dying and dying and dying. And then, on December 25, the days become longer, and so now he was suddenly resurrecting from the dead. And so, we find here that they're actually practicing one of the rites and ceremonies that was established by Nimrod way back in Babylon. Now notice also Jeremiah 7 and verses 18 and 19. Another one of these deplorable practices that Israel had that they adopted from the pagan nations. It says there in Jeremiah 7 and verses 18 and 19, the children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women need dough to make cakes. For whom? for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? Notice that they were worshiping, according to this, 
the queen of heaven. I want you to remember that specific terminology. They were worshiping the queen of heaven. By the way, they did it through silver. Gold was used to worship the sun god because the sun is yellow. Silver was used to depict the moon goddess because it is the color of the moon, which the moon is white or silver. And so Israel here is making cakes to the queen of heaven. They're worshiping the king of heaven. They're, they're queen of heaven. They're bowing before her. They've adopted the pagan practices of the surrounding nations. For this reason God decided that he needed to send Israel into captivity for 70 years. And so King Nebuchadnezzar came in the year 605 and he overcame Jerusalem. There were three captivities. Jerusalem was destroyed and God's people were taken captive to Babylon for a period of 70 years. In Babylon they were cured of their idolatry. In other words they made up their minds that they were not going to worship idols ever again. They were not going to worship Tamas. They were not going to worship the Queen of Heaven. They were not going to make cakes to her. They were not going to pour out drink offerings to the pagan gods. They were going to be faithful to God in not practicing idolatry. Now the question is how could the devil continue proliferating this apostate religion that began in Babel if the children of Israel had decided that they would remain separate from the uh, practices of the surrounding pagan nations if they had isolated themselves from these pagan nations. Well let me give you a little bit of history about what happened after the Babylonian captivity when Israel had been cured once and for all from this idolatry from adopting the pagan pra practices of the surrounding nations. Go with me to Ezra chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3. It's speaking here about Cyrus, king of Persia. He's the one that came by the way and conquered Babylon along with uh, Darius the Mede. It says there, thus says Cyrus king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah. Who is among you all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judah and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God which is in Jerusalem. I find it rather remarkable that Cyrus this king of the Medo-Persian Empire would actually say God has told me to build him a temple in Jerusalem. Now the question is how did he know that God was telling him to build him a temple in Jerusalem? Well the fact is that the name of Cyrus had been given in Bible prophecy over a hundred years before he was born in Isaiah 45 and verse 1. And it's very likely that when Cyrus dried up the river Euphrates and entered into the city of Babylon he met Daniel there because Daniel was in the banquet room and Daniel probably opened the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and said I've been waiting for you. Your name has been prophesied 100 years before you were born God says that you are going to be his shepherd you are going to be the deliverer of his people. And so undoubtedly Cyrus seeing this providential sign said I must fulfill the will of God. And you know what's interesting? There are two individuals, two ancient kings which became monotheistic. In other words they came to the point of believing that there was only one true God. One of them was Tutankhamun. And I believe that that has to do with the Exodus. And the other king was Darius and Cyrus and the Persian rulers. In fact they it, they established a new religion called Zoroastrianism where you had a good God and you had an evil God in constant conflict or controversy. Very similar to the idea that we find of the conflict between God and Satan in Scripture and they believed in only one true God. Where do you suppose that Darius and Cyrus got that idea from? It must have been from Daniel and from the Hebrews. Now interestingly enough in Babylon there remained some pagan priests that uh, had 
uh, proliferated the religion of Babylon, those Chaldeans as they're called in Daniel chapter 2. And Darius the first, who is not the same Darius the Mede, in the year 520 he said, I'm not going to put up with these pagan priests in Babylon and so what he did, he massacred these pagan priests and the ones who were able to survive actually fled to the city of Pergamum in Asia Minor. In the year 482 King Xerxes did the same thing, there were still some priests left over in Babylon and so he once again massacred these pagan priests of the Babylonian type not the priesthood of the Zoroastrian religion but the priesthood of the Babylonian religion and once again these priests fled to Asia Minor to the city of Pergamum. By the way you can read this fascinating story in the book The Mysteries of Mithra written by a Roman Catholic scholar whose name is Franz Cumont. He's also written several other books on uh, religions in Asia Minor and in the Roman Empire. Interestingly enough these pagan priests that went to Perg Pergamum rooted their religious, their polytheistic religious ideas in Pergamum. In this way the pagan polytheistic religion of Babylon was transferred to Pergamum. And you say why is this important? It's very important for the reason that according to Virgil the Latin poet and other Roman writers like Homer they say that Roman civilization and religion was an import from Asia Minor, specifically from Pergamum. You can read it in this book that I made reference to. Interesting that the religion of ancient Babylon went to Pergamum and from Pergamum it was imported into pagan Rome. In other words it became the official religion of pagan Rome. Perhaps this is the reason why in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13 if you go with me there, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13 Rome is called Babylon. Notice it says there, she who is in Babylon elect together with you greets you and so does Mark my son. Most scholars believe that this is a reference to Rome. In other words Rome is being called Babylon. Why? Because the religion of Babylon was transported from ancient Babylon, from the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar to Pergamum and from Pergamum or through Pergamum into pagan Rome. But now we must go one step further. And I must go quickly here, I don't have time to go into all of the ramifications of this prophecy so I'm only going to describe it. In Revelation chapter 13 we have a composite beast. This beast has the characteristics of a lion, a, lep a bear, a leopard, and a dragon beast. And the dragon beast has ten horns. And then we're told that that dragon beast with ten horns gives his throne, his authority, and his power to this beast. In other words the dragon gives his power to this beast, to this composite beast. Now the question is, what does this composite beast represent? Actually it's very simple. The lion represents Babylon. The bear represents Medo-Persia. The leopard represents Greece. The dragon beast is Rome because the dragon beast in Revelation 12 tried to kill the child when the child was born. So the dragon beast is Rome. And then Rome was divided into ten kingdoms. Those, those are the ten horns in the year 476. And then it says that this dragon beast with ten horns gives his seat, his power, and his authority to this composite beast. In other words after the Roman Empire would arise a power that would receive the seat and the authority that existed in pagan Rome along with its civilization and its religion. The question is which was this power which arose after pagan Rome that proliferated the religion of the ancient Roman Empire that Rome received from Pergamum and that Pergamum received from Babylon in unbroken chain. Folks I wish I could say otherwise but it was the Roman Catholic Papacy. 
Even writers of the Roman Catholic Church, scholars, for example, like Cardinal Gibbons, very clearly say that most of the practices and beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church were imported from paganism. Sunday, uh, the idea of nuns, vestal virgins, the idea of incense, the idea of uh, icons, the idea of idols in the churches. In fact, I don't know whether you're aware, but there in, in the Vatican, uh, you have uh, in St. Peter's uh, Cathedral, uh, you have an image of Jupiter. You say, no, it's not of Jupiter, it's of Peter. Yes, it was of Jupiter, and they adopted, and they converted Jupiter into Peter. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't hide this. They actually acquired their religion and their organizational structure and their political structure from ancient Rome. And Rome had received it from Pergamum, and Pergamum had received it from Babylon. Now, I find it very interesting that Pergamum is also involved in the transfer from pagan Rome to papal Rome. Go with me to Revelation chapter 2 and verses 13 and 14. This is going to get more and more fascinating. By the way, as you're looking for Revelation 2 verses 13 and 14, allow me to tell you something about the seven churches of Revelation. The seven churches, according to most scholars, represent seven periods of the history of the Christian church from apostolic times till the end of time. Most scholars that I've read believe that the church of Ephesus represents the apostolic church, the church that went out conquering and to conquer, that set the world on fire with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second church, the church of Smyrna, is the persecuted church. There's a lot of death language connected with the church of Smyrna. And in fact, most scholars believe that it represents the period of the church under the period of the Roman emperors, the early Roman emperors who persecuted Christians and threw them to the lions and made them fight with animals in the Colosseum and with gladiators, etc. And so Smyrna is the persecuted church. It's where the devil tried to destroy the growth of the church by persecution. But the devil soon discovered that instead of stomping out the church by persecution, the church grew all the more. And so he had to use a different method. And so now you enter the third church. The third church is called Pergamum. Interesting. Now let's read about Pergamum. Chapter 2 and verses 13 and 14. And to the angel of the church in Pergamus write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works, and where you dwell, and where Satan's throne is. Remember that uh, this dragon beast gave his throne to this next beast? It continues saying, And you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But now notice verse 14. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, very important, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Notice that the problem with the church of Pergamum is that Balaam is there influencing the church. Now in order to understand why this is important we have to go back to the story of Balaam in Numbers 22 to 24. Let's notice Numbers 22 and verse 12. It just so happens that Balak wants Balaam to curse Israel. It says, And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. God says to Balaam, You can't curse Israel. They're blessed. The question is, why was Israel blessed? Notice Numbers 23 and verses 21 to 23. Behold, I have received a command to bless. This is Balaam speaking. He has blessed and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord, his God, is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. 
For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. You see, Israel was in a proper relationship with the Lord. And therefore the devil could not destroy Israel through persecution, through warfare. But the devil soon discovers that there's a better way to destroy Israel. You see, just like the early church grew, grew phenomenally, the devil tried to destroy the church by persecution, but he couldn't because the church was in a good relationship with the Lord. Now the devil says, I have to implement plan B. And what was that plan B? Plan B was, if you cannot fight them or destroy them from outside, then infiltrate them with the practices, with the pagan practices of the nations, and then they will be destroyed. Notice Numbers 31 and verse 16 on how Balaam was successful in his endeavor. It says there in Numbers 31 verse 16, Look, these women, the women of Moab, caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. And so what the devil did was to use Balaam to entice Israel to adopt the practices of the Moabites to follow their idolatrous practices, their worship practices, and as a result they broke their covenant with the Lord and there was great decimation among the people of God. The same thing happened in the early church. When Ephesus went out conquering and to conquer, the early church, the apostolic church, it grew phenomenally. The devil says, I have to destroy this church because it's winning subjects for Jesus Christ. And so now comes the church of uh, Smyrna, the church that is persecuted. But the more the devil persecutes, the more the church grows. And so the devil says, I have to do something. And so you enter the church of Pergamum where Balaam is influencing. And what the devil does through an emperor called Constantine, he introduces into Christianity idolatrous practices of the Roman Empire. You know, even uh, Constantine the Great, uh, he claimed to be a Christian, but he actually worshiped the sun god, Deus Sol Invictus, the invincible god. He actually had coins printed that said, to the invincible god, and it had a sun on it. In other words, Constantine was a sun worshiper. He was only converted nominally to Christianity. And all of these ideas from pagan Rome were transferred via Pergamum into the Roman Catholic Church. And many scholars in the Roman Catholic Church today admit that many of the practices that now exist in the church actually were imported directly from the religions of the pagan Roman Empire. Among those things that we're going to study which were imported into the Christian church was the veneration of the Virgin Mother. That which had originated all the way back at the Tower of Babel which was transferred from Babel to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon because Nebuchadnezzar actually boasted that he was reestablishing the kingdom which existed at Babel. And then it was transferred from the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar to Pergamum through the apostate priesthood. From the city of Pergamum it was transferred to Rome and through the church of Pergamum, it was transferred from pagan Rome to papal Rome in unbroken chain. Now in our next study together, we're going to take a look at uh, a topic which I have chosen to title, Mary, the rival of Jesus. You say, how in the world could you title a lecture, Mary, the rival of Jesus? We're going to see how all of these ideas that originated back with Nimrod and Semiramis and Tamus that were transferred to Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar and then transferred to Rome and then transferred to the Roman Catholic Church have proliferated today in the Christian Church. And we're going to see how the mother is venerated to such a great degree that the child is practically placed on a second plane. 
Now I would like to note it, I'd like you to notice in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1 that God is going to have a true church in the end time. A church that upholds the truth of God as it's found in Holy Scripture. This woman is depicted as clothed with the sun and standing on the moon. Notice Revelation 12 and verse 1. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Now we're going to find that the Roman Catholic Church believes that this woman actually is symbolic of Mary. But the fact is, for reasons that we studied in our first lecture, this woman actually is a representation of the Old Testament church and the New Testament church. In other words, Jesus was born from the woman. Yes, He was born from the Old Testament church. And then later on the woman flees to the wilderness. That means that the church in the New Testament period flees to the wilderness when she's persecuted by the serpent. In other words, God is going to have, according to this verse, a true church which will bring the Messiah into the world, and this true church, after the Messiah is caught up to God and to His throne, is going to be persecuted by the serpent, is going to be persecuted by the dragon to try and destroy her because she upholds the truth of God. But do you know that in Revelation, the apostate religion is also represented by a woman? Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verses 1 through 6. Revelation chapter 17 and verses 1 through 6. This will be our final passage in our study. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. By the way, if a pure church represents a pure church, a harlot must represent a what? Must represent a fallen church. Notice that she's seated on many waters. Verse 15 explains that the many waters represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. So this is an apostate system of religion that sits or governs on nations, tongues, multitudes, and peoples. And now notice verse 2 with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. Notice that she's involved in the political systems of the world. She fornicates with the kings of the earth, according to this. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. By the way, the wine represents false teachings. It represents false doctrines. In fact, a little later on in this passage, we're going to notice that it represents her abominations. If you want to look up in Scripture the word abominations in a concordance, you'll find that abominations are composed of many things. Worshiping the sun, thinking that you can eat unclean foods, thinking that you can say, be saved uh, in violation of the law of God, uh, and many other things as well. So notice that she gives the wine, she makes the nations drunk with the wine of her fornication. Notice verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And notice how this woman is arrayed. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Interesting colors, right? Purple and scarlet. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Notice that this is a system that majors in gold and silver and precious stones and pearls. And she's clothed in purple and scarlet. And it says, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. By the way, fornication means that you are married to Jesus, but at the same time you're married with paganism. In other words, you're adopting pagan practices into the church like ancient Israel did. Let me ask you, why would God rebuke ancient Israel for adopting pagan practices and He would not rebuke the Christian church for importing pagan practices? Would you expect God to keep the Christian church just as pure as He wanted to keep ancient Israel? Of course. It continues saying in verse 5, 
Notice her name. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great. What is this system of apostate religion called? Babylon, interestingly enough. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And then you'll notice that this is a persecuting power. She persecutes those that don't agree with her teachings. It says in verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Now I would like to read one final text. I know I said that this was the last one, but I need to read one more before we draw this to a close. Jeremiah chapter 51 and verses 7 and 8. We began with Babylon, and we said that these teachings of paganism were transferred from Babel to the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar to Rome through Pergamum, and then through to Papal Rome through the church of Pergamum. In other words, Babylon is found all the way through. These ideas come from antiquity. You know, sometimes I've wondered why so many religions in the world, for example, use a rosary. It's not only in the Roman Catholic Church that a rosary is used. Muslims use rosaries. Hindus use rosaries. You know that what I'm saying is true. Where would they all get the idea of saying prayers and using beads for their prayers? It's because all of these practices ultimately come from one source. They ultimately come from where? From Babylon, which is Satan's apostate system of religion. Notice Jeremiah 51, 7 and 8. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand. And notice what she did that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations are deranged. So we need, to be beware, we need to beware of the religion of Babylon. And God actually says in Revelation 18, Come out of her, my people.